Hello, friend. We had a little technical difficulty getting the video started on the sermon, and we missed just the first few paragraphs. So let me bring you up to date. Uh, here from uh, a view of Victoria Harbor, we sped out of church and grabbed a little bit of uh, R&R. &R. At any rate, we're back in our series from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy that we started that I'm calling God in the Midst. This whole series is called God in the Midst. Uh, we started with chapter one a couple of weeks ago, and today we'll be in chapters uh, two and three. And uh, these first three chapters of Deuteronomy really make up the, uh, the introduction to the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy has been described as a book on the boundary. Uh, these are the final words of Moses. Uh, last time we described that Deuteronomy is sort of a, of a bookend to the first five books of the Bible, those five books of Modus, Moses, the Pentateuch. So Genesis is the book of beginnings, then you have Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy really summarizes uh, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, and, and Deuteronomy. Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. Uh, Deuteronomy is really a, a, a sermon that Moses preached uh, in his final days to the people that he had led for those many years. Like I said, Deuteronomy has been, been described as a book on the boundary, and it's written on the boundary of the Jordan, uh, east of the Promised Land. After Moses led the people out of Pharaoh's slavery and after their 40-year wilderness experience, uh, chapters 2 and 3 summarize that wilderness experience. And there's a key verse upon which I'd like to focus our attention. It's verse 7 in chapter 2, and it records Moses saying to the people, The Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He has watched over your journey through this vast wilderness, these 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you, and you have not lacked anything. You know, I'm not sure what you might think of that wilderness experience, but it seems that this verse should determine what we think of the wilderness experience. Uh, maybe you, you don't really think anything of the wilderness experience at all, right? Just a bunch of ancient history, but we ought to think something of it since it is such a significant part of history. Um, even in purely secular history, these events of the Jewish people securing this homeland has a great deal to do with the news of the day, right? I mean, our president was there in this homeland just a few days ago, highlighting how Israel's place in the world has a whole lot to do with world, with world peace. Israel's place in the world has a whole lot to do with our peace. Uh, maybe you think of the wilderness experience merely as a consequence of failure. A consequence of failure. A, sig a, a significant con con consequence. <laughs> a significant consequence of a really big failure. God called Moses to lead the people of God out of Egypt, right? Freeing them from the tyranny of Pharaoh. God performed spectacular miracles leading up to the Exodus and continued to do miracles uh, as the people fo followed God, right? Think of the parting of the Red Sea, for example. But on the eastern banks of the Jordan River, after hearing the majority report from the scouts, those scouts that went ahead of them to figure out which way they were going to go in, after hearing the majority report from the scouts, the people determined that they could not take possession of the land. And God, in response to their faithless decision, turned them back into the wilderness for 40 years. Time enough for a generation to pass away. Now there was failure there for sure. But it had to be more than merely failure since there was also God's blessing there in the wilderness, right? Moses proclaimed it clearly. The Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands out there in the wilderness. He watched over the journey out there in the wilderness. Those 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you, he said, and you've not lacked anything. It had to be more than merely failure with God's blessing 
all mixed up in it. What do we make of that? I mean, what do, you, what do we make of that in contrast to what we find recorded in chapter 1? Uh, if we were to flip a page back, we can read that after their initial decision, after the people of God, after Israel's initial decision to not enter the promised land, after the Lord pronounced judgment, the people reconsidered. Hey, wait a second, <laughs> they said. Moses put it this way, then you replied, we have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight as the Lord our God commanded us. So every one of you put on his weapons, thinking it easy to go into the hill country. But the Lord said to me, tell them do not go up and fight because I will not be with you. You would be defeated by your enemies. So they changed their minds. They changed their minds. They had the same resources. They had the same army. They had the same enemy. <laughs> but God told them that they would fail after changing their minds. Everything was the same, except the leading and blessing of the Lord. Even though they feared before, they would have succeeded with the Lord's blessing. Now, with their own resolve, the power of their new positive thinking, if you will, now they would fail. The leading of the Lord is the only difference required between success and failure, right? Everything else was the same, except the leading and blessing of the Lord, and that's the only difference required. That's the only thing required to, between success and failure. Do we know that's true? Do we know it's true from personal experience? You don't have to, you don't have to. <laughs> I mean, that's a sermon in itself, right? But the difference between success and failure is the leading of the Lord. Let that sink in. I mean, we may know it from experience, and we can certainly know it from the testimony of God's word. There were lessons to be learned, right? The people of God had it wrong when they thought they could so easily change their minds. And they had it wrong when they thought it would be easy to just strap on their weapons and take possession of the land. They failed to understand that there would not only be physical battles fought with swords and such, there would be battles for minds and hearts. While they may have been Prepared for the physical battles, their faithless decision to not move forward with God was proof that they were not prepared for the battles over their hearts and minds. There were lessons to be learned, and those lessons would be learned in the wilderness. The wilderness. <laughs> this classroom was, was an awesome time of testing in which the whole generation Failed. The, the promised land was full, not only of giants in the eyes of the Israelites, but it was also full of idolatry and wickedness in the eyes of God. The challenge would be in regards to faith and loyalty in the midst of all of that. You may have heard me say, uh, say it several times, God does not waste pain. I say that from time to time. God does not waste pain. <laughs> and while the wilderness was, in part, pain from a self-inflicted wound, God intended to use the wilderness to teach his people lessons of faith, lessons of loyalty, lessons of obedience. The truth is, there is always preparation before performing God's work. And that preparation often seems like a wilderness experience. Right? There is always preparation before performing God's work. And that preparation, especially during the time, often seems like a wilderness experience. We ought to know that from personal experience. And we can know it from observing the lives of others. Perhaps the best example is set before us by Jesus. 
uh, before crossing his own, own Jordan River into ministry, Jesus had a wilderness experience, a 40-day wilderness, wilderness experience. Uh, it turns out that uh, 40 is a number that shows up in the Bible from time to time, and it's often associated with preparation. Uh, that's why I don't trust anybody under the age of 40, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> No, 40 is often a number associated with preparation, whether it's 40 years or 40 days, 40 days and nights. It's no coincidence that Jesus fasted for 40 days in preparation for his ministry. Uh, allow me to point out another coincidence that likely isn't so much of a coincidence after all. Uh, the preparation of Jesus in the wilderness was capped off, terminated <laughs> with temptation by the devil. It's recorded in Matthew 4. The enemy directed three specific temptations at Jesus, and in each case, Jesus quoted Scripture as he refused to entertain the devil's enticements. It turns out that all three of those Scriptures, each of those three Scriptures, came from the same book in the Bible, the same Old Testament book in the Bible. Would you care to guess? Would you, do you have just a wild, random guess on which book of the Bible Jesus quoted three times in the face of the devil in his temptation? Do you have a guess? Deuteronomy. Of course it was Deuteronomy. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy while in that 40 days of temptation, at the end of that 40 days of temptation. This, these were the scriptures that he chose. When Jesus said, as it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. When Jesus said, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test, Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy 6.16. When he said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus was quoting Deuteronomy 6.13. Jesus apparently had a very high view of Deuteronomy. So don't dare come to me and ask me while we're spending all this time in that dumb book of Deuteronomy. <laughs> Jesus had a very high view of this book that we're devoting ourselves to for the, for the coming weeks. Shouldn't we conclude that Jesus was making a tie between his 40-day preparation in the wilderness and the 40-year wilderness experience of the people of God? The 40 years in the wilderness was a foreshadow, I believe, of the 40 days that Jesus prepared in the wilderness, which could not be fully accomplished with the 40-year wilderness experience by the people of God would be fully accomplished by the only truly obedient one, the Son of God. Yet even the perfect, holy, beautiful, wonderful, glorious Son of God was subject to suffering, including suffering with the fasting and the temptation in the wilderness. Of course, we too suffer times of preparation <laughs> in wildernesses. I would go so far to say that if we find ourselves doing God's work but can't look back on hard times of preparation, it could be that we are not yet really doing God's work. <laughs> the, seem, the two just seem to go hand in hand. I mean, we can think about it from either perspective, right? We can look at the way God uses us now and think back to what prepared us, or we can think back on hard times and consider what we learned then that God is using in our lives now. Have you had any hard times? <laughs> yeah, we've all had hard times. Um, our son went blind for a while. I learned a lot through that, and, uh, and I know he did too. Um, I got fired once. That really stunk. <laughs> but I sure learned a lot through that, and I wouldn't be doing 
the good work that I'm privileged to do now had it not been for that tough time. Can you relate? There, there are times like these. Sometimes those lessons are learned like in the, you know, relatively recently within a matter of years. Sometimes those lessons go way back, <laughs> even to our childhood. Uh, so for just a kind of a silly example, really, I often think of a really benign episode from my middle school years, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and before fire and electricity were discovered. <laughs> uh, middle school, you know, 40 years ago. Uh, when I was in ninth grade, I served on our yearbook staff, our middle school yearbooks staff. Yeah, I was that cool. Oh yeah. Yeah, it was a pretty big deal. <laughs> it was a pretty big deal. What are you laughing at? <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> well, I thought it was a big deal because we had to apply to be on the yearbook staff. And only a very few were accepted. Middle school for me back then was grades six, seven, eight, and nine, four years of middle school back then. And we could apply for the yearbook staff starting in seventh grade. And I applied every year. Seventh grade, nope. Eighth grade, nope. But ninth grade, the third try, I got in. <sighs> My best friend Ross Fortini got in on his first try in seventh grade. <laughs> Ross was way cooler than me. <laughs> he had this really cool, long, blonde hair that parted in the middle and feathered back. It was awesome. <laughs> he could ride a skateboard way better than that. He could ride a wheelie basically as long as he wanted. I, I couldn't. I could barely pop a wheelie. Ross was way cooler than me, and he got in in seventh grade. Uh, our yearbook was called The Apollo. The Apollo, uh, because our school was named after Virgil Grissom, a famous... Hoosier. Uh, I'm a Hoosier. I grew up in Portage, Indiana. So I went to Virgil Grissom Middle School. Grissom's the one in the middle. Gus Grissom was an astronaut, as you can see, one of the original Mercury 7, the second man sent to space. Uh, Grissom died tragically during testing for Apollo 1. Uh, he was incinerated with two others. Uh, White and Chaffee, the other two pictured there, while testing the launch capsule for Apollo 1. There's still debate over exactly what went wrong. The consensus is everything went wrong. <laughs> On this Memorial Day weekend, uh, we can remember that those who died in military service, like Colonel Grissom, not only gave their lives in war, but in other meaningful service as well, right? Like leading humanity in pursuits of technology and exploration like Grissom and White and Chaffee. Thank God for them. And thank God for all those who sacrificed for our freedom on this Memorial Day. At any rate, <laughs> so we thought that uh, we were pretty cool on the Apollo staff, putting together our middle school yearbook. And early in the year, we got our jobs. Uh, we had to apply for those jobs too, now, I determined to apply for the coolest job, which, of course, is photographer, right? I mean, the yearbook photographer is the... the Ross Fortini was a yearbook photographer. Like I said, Ross was cooler than me. Uh, I figured I had an in since my best friend Ross was this now grizzled old seasoned photographer having shot pictures for three years and, and I had been his unofficial assistant on shoots, his intern, if you will, his grunt, Zachary. So I figured I had an in. I mean, I even was, uh, was in the dark room <laughs> and everybody under 30, maybe even 40 goes, what's a dark room? <laughs> shooting on black and white film and processing the film in the dark room in middle school and printing the prints, whole nother world, right? So I applied to uh, be a photographer and not only did I not get the coolest job, I got the least cool job. The least cool job. I got the advertising section. 
I mean, we were responsible to sell ads, gather the information, and lay out the ads in those last several pages of the yearbook to which nobody pays any attention. Oh, I know. I had a really tough, tough childhood, right? First world problems. But here's the thing. I learned a ton that year. Uh, I learned business principles. Uh, I learned selling tactics. I learned a lot about layout and design. And it was my first marketing job. <laughs> uh, and it led to other marketing jobs. Uh, the ad design skills acquired in that least cool job provided opportunity in the small business that I uh, later worked for and made ads for the, the small business exactly the same way that I did for the yearbook with those cutting out letters from those acetate sheets and putting them on the ruler and laying them down and using the X-Acto knife and all the various things that we did way back then. Uh, skills developed there made way for other marketing jobs. Uh, I use skills developed on that yearbook staff to this day. It was preparation for the way God is using me in various ways now. It was a really important part of my preparation. Now, seriously, <laughs> uh, doing that job in ninth grade doesn't seem like much suffering now. It didn't seem so great to my dumb teenage brain back then, but it's, I mean, seriously, in the grand course of things, not that big of a deal. I have, of course, suffered far worse, and I've learned more meaningful lessons from deeper and longer and more serious suffering, but hey, it's a holiday weekend, so I thought I'd keep it light. <laughs> uh, we get the point, though, don't we? I mean, God has a way to work things together for our good. He weaves the experiences of our lives, even the failures, perhaps especially the failures, into something useful for his purpose and glory. So can that be an encouraging reminder for those who may be in a wilderness today? Are you in a wilderness today? If you're finding yourself in an especially difficult season, just think what the Lord might be doing. Just think what the Lord might be doing. Could today's wilderness be preparation for God's promise in the days or even decades ahead? God was with his people in the wilderness then, and he is with us in our various wildernesses now. Know that he is watching over our journeys, even through the vast wildernesses. Well, before we leave today's text, uh, let's give our attention to the end of chapter three. So, uh, reflecting on the closing days of, those, of this wilderness experience, Moses wrote these words. He said, at that time, now remember, he's talking to the people of his God's, God's people there on the other side of the Jordan, not crossed yet over into the promised land, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, he said, at that time, I pleaded with the Lord. Sovereign Lord, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your strong hand. For what God is there on heaven, in heaven or on earth who can do the deeds and mighty things that you do? Let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan. Let me go. Let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that fine hill country in Lebanon. But because of you, the Lord was angry with me and would not listen to me. That is enough, the Lord said. Do not speak to me any more about this matter. Go up to the top of Pishkah and look west and north and south and east. Look at the land with your own eyes, since you are not going to cross this Jordan River. But commission Joshua and encourage and strengthen him. For he will lead this people across and will cause them to inherit the land that you will see. Well, that doesn't seem fair, does it? If anyone deserved to enjoy the promised land, it'd be Moses, right? Well, first off, nobody deserved to go into the land. <laughs> nobody deserved to go into the land. The death of Moses outside the land would witness to the reality of God's judgment, just as Joshua's victorious entry would be a witness of the reality of God's forgiveness and grace. No one deserved it. In verse 26, Moses blames the people for his predicament. 
And there's a great deal of, uh, of writing about this. Since what Moses writes in Deuteronomy here, and in other parts of Deuteronomy, might not seem to align precisely with the account that he wrote in Numbers 20. Uh, it was a situation in which Moses was carelessly disobedient. A moment where God pronounced to Moses that he would not enter the land. There was a moment like that. So which was it? Did Moses not enter the land because of his disobedience or because of the faithful, faithlessness of those he led? Uh, was it the price of leadership that Moses was paying or was it the price of his personal sin? Uh, did the fault lie with Moses or the people? I think it's likely both. It seems to me that it's both. And there are lessons that we can learn here. We can learn that, that sometimes our wilderness experiences are not entirely our fault. And sometimes those wilderness experiences are for the benefit of those who will come after us. Again, on this Memorial Day weekend, we're reminded that we are part of something bigger than ourselves. And sometimes... Our individual suffering is for the good of the greater whole. Besides, Moses was not alone in, uh, in like unfair suffering. <laughs> yeah. oh, there were only 10 that came back with a negative report and only a majority of the people determined to not possess the land. There, there must have been others beyond Joshua and Caleb who were full of faith and ready to receive the Lord's promise. And then, of course, there was this whole generation born in the wilderness. They suffered too, having no part in the original disobedience. In our journey, through wildernesses and otherwise, do you ever wonder with me if you're a Moses or a Joshua? <laughs> do you ever wonder with me if you're a Moses or a Joshua? As we are part of enterprises bigger than ourselves, like the church, for example, are we the ones to enjoy the next victory, like Joshua? Or are we the ones who are setting the stage for those who are following, like Moses? Joshua or Moses, which are we? I mean, maybe we think it's obvious, uh, right? The old are more like Moses and the young are more like Joshua. <laughs> and those in between are, well, in between. Is it that simple? You see, I think we all find ourselves like both Moses and Joshua. We each have a future. We each have a future. And we are all setting the stage, making a way for those to follow. God uses us both ways all the time. I mean, that's what it means to be among the people of God, part of God's family and community with one another. Sometimes we're setting the stage like Moses, blazing a trail. Sometimes we're like Joshua, uh, the ones waiting to take the victory the next day. So take courage. <laughs> God is not done with any of us. There are days ahead, and there is eternity ahead. And we are part of something bigger than ourselves. And we have responsibility to the community. We need those like Moses and we need those like Joshua. And each of us are likely a bit like both. So let's learn these lessons and apply them well. Lessons of contentment with God's provision in all times especially in the wildernesses. Maybe you're, maybe, maybe you're, th you're thinking about your own circumstances and you're thinking, you know, I'm sure glad those wilderness experiences are behind me. <laughs> maybe you're be beyond the wildernesses. Give God thanks for the way he does not waste pain, thanking him for the valuable lessons learned. This is the way God treats us and teaches us. But maybe you find yourself in a wilderness. Are you in a wilderness today? Thank God for his presence and blessing in the wilderness. 
knowing that he is accomplishing his work in us, even in suffering. And, and maybe you just find yourself like outside of the people of God altogether. Perhaps you just not turn to God in faith, trusting Jesus with your life and eternity. And friend, today is a day to believe. Today is a day to know that believing may not relieve suffering. You know what? It probably won't. Believing may not relieve suffering, but it will give meaning to suffering. It will give use to suffering. It will make suffering meaningful and worthwhile. So I invite you, join us in this journey. Join us. Would you stand with me? I'd like to lead you in prayer before we, uh, before we go today. God, we turn to you thinking, uh, thanking you for, uh, for your presence. We are in your presence now, both in victory and defeat, in pain and plenty, and yes, even in the wilderness. We are in your presence, and we thank you, God. For we who are in the wilderness now, I pray especially for, for those that you'd give gifts of faith and courage to trust you. And for those like Joshua among us who are eager to take on tomorrow's challenges, we give thanks. And for those like Moses among us who are making a way for our futures, for these we give thanks to. God, use us. Teach us. Through suffering, in suffering, through victory, through all of it, God, we are yours and we trust you. We devote our lives to you, our wills to you, our futures to you, and we thank you that, uh, that we are yours. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks for watching the sermon today. I know that several watch the sermons online, and from time to time people ask, how can I help? Well, we're working to uh, put some gear in place, some software and some equipment to make those online broadcasts even better. Uh, the first chunk, the first increment is a thousand dollar increment. So maybe you can help us with a small gift, maybe you can help us with the whole thing. Once we're through with that first thousand increment, then I've got a couple of two thousand dollar increments that'll follow that. So if you'd like to help, you can go to our website, cpnorthshore.com slash give and you'll find information on how you can mail a gift or even make a gift online. Thanks for considering helping us and helping us to make these online broadcasts even better.